welcome to a Rice University podcast. For more information about us, please visit our website at www.rice.edu. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all very much for coming, and uh, welcome to this, our last lecture this semester in our series on memory. Uh, my name is Susan McIntosh, and I'm the director of Ciencia. Uh, we've had two recent lectures in this series by Jess Logan of Psychology and Eric Kandel of Columbia that shared a common thread of the neuroscience of memory. But we began the series in September with a talk that focused on the cultural, lab, cultural elaboration via computer technology of external memory storage. And we're returning to the cultural aspects of memory today in a talk that takes us to the origins of the original breakthrough invention in external memory storage, written language. Humans had, for millennia prior to this invention, used cultural devices, which may have included things like cave paintings and portable carvings, beads, or textiles, as mnemonic devices to unlock or guide memories about ritual performances, travel routes, or other culturally meaningful information. But the memories, of course, could not be accessed independently of the people's, people whose brains stored them. All that changed with writing, which made the external storage and perpetuation of memory possible, independent of people storing the memories. And it also made uh, possible the manipulation of memory, which in some ways made politics possible. <laughs> We're fortunate to have with us today someone who has made this momentous transition in human history one of her specialties, Sarah Costello is an archaeologist whose geographical focus is the Near East and the Eastern Mediterranean. Her research areas include visual culture, technologies of memory, ideology, and resistance. She earned her PhD in anthropology at uh, State University of New York Binghamton in 2002, and her master's degree in classical and Near Eastern archaeology at Bryn Mawr College. She's an instructional assistant professor at the University of Houston and has excavated in Turkey, Israel, Greece, and the United States. Her work has appeared in the journals Antiquity, Near Eastern Archaeology, and Istanbuler Mitteilungen, as well as in several volumes related to salvage projects in southeastern Turkey. Dr. Castello chairs an annual session on archaeological theory at the annual meeting of the American Schools of Oriental Research. It is a real pleasure for me to welcome Sarah Castello speaking on the topic Stealing Memory, Temples, Shamans, and the Struggle for Power in early Mesopotamian state formation. Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Susan McIntosh, for inviting me to share my work with this audience. Um, and thank you especially for that introduction, which really sets the stage for what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, which is the way that the people in the Neolithic Near East remembered and the connection between those technologies of memory and their religious beliefs and the changes that took place in those with the invention of writing. My evidence is a set of imagery found on the small portable objects that people used to record and remember in the thousands of years before writing was invented. It's sometimes hard for people to get their head around the chronology that, that I talk about, 9,000 BC. So here's a little reminder of, um, of, of this time period, because this, this is the murky, distant past. Um, and reconstructing Neolithic society can be a challenge, but ultimately, it's a process of theory building and interpretation, the building blocks of science. However, Certain facets of life in the past lend themselves more easily to testable theory building than others. The material record, the bones, stone, ceramic, and plant remains, for example. From these sorts of remains, archaeologists have come to understand a great deal about the way that the people of the Neolithic built houses and 
pro procured food, um, and about their various technologies from chipped stone tool making to pottery. Human society is so much more than economy, however. This is particularly true during the Neolithic period, a time when humans were learning how to be civilized, how to live together in permanent settlements, Is this one working now? OK. An emerging set of compelling imagery offers us insights into the minds of Neolithic people. Yet this imagery has been largely neglected. This example is a small stone palette engraved with images that would fit in the palm of your hand. A number of these were found at two sites in northern Syria and dated to approximately 9,000 BC, the very beginning of the Neolithic period, when most people had not yet begun to live in permanent settlements or to grow their own food or to raise animals. Yet they created these complex images with different arrangements of animal symbols and geometric marks. As I will show you, Related imagery is found carved on other portable objects, as well as on megalithic stones, and painted both on pottery and on the walls of houses during the Neolithic period. These are clearly meaningful images. As I will argue, these images refer to a powerful shamanistic belief system. The fact that a powerful and widespread Neolithic visual tradition has been largely neglected until now might seem surprising. In fact, several factors account for this neglect. First, the time period in question, from the end of the Paleolithic through the Neolithic, is generally studied by archaeologists taking an anthropological approach and considering issues such as food procurement, settlement patterns, and specialization of labor. Anthropological archaeology often does not include the interpretation of art and symbolic images. A second methodological obstacle is the manner in which sites are published. Excavators tend to report their findings in individual site reports that generally include a short section called small finds or other finds, in which small pieces such as tokens, seals, and figurines, as well as any unexplained objects, are illustrated. This tradition means that many items, even those that are not understood, are at least published. However, broader studies of these small finds are very rare. This is due in part to the time demands of the initial publication, and also because of the overriding interest in issues such as food procurement, settlement patterns, and so on. Third, art historians are rarely involved in archaeological excavations from these periods. It is costly for foreign teams to bring specialists into the field, and art historians are not a priority for most teams as they plan their excavation or study seasons. Since objects must generally stay in the country in which they're found, these objects often do not receive further study after they are initially recorded. Aside from financial issues and the problem of access for foreign art historians to materials stored in museums in the Near East, there is also a scarcity of art historians seeking to investigate the art from these early periods. Specialists in ancient art tend to focus on time periods with a greater wealth of artistic expression. Finally, I would argue that the small finds and other examples of Paleolithic and Neolithic visual expression from the Near East are not examined in detail because the interpretation of meaning in prehistory is difficult and controversial. For all these reasons, 5,000 years of human visual expression has been virtually ignored. It is only in recent years that researchers have allowed themselves to consider the cognitive aspects of Neolithic society, the thoughts, beliefs, fears, and hopes that shaped society as people invented civilization. Many archaeologists now recognize that people are not mere respondents to their environment, that they act not only to optimize their subsistence practices, but also to engage with the world spiritually, artistically, and socially. Recent work by scholars such as David Lewis Williams, David Pierce, 
Steve Mithin and Ian Hodder, argue for religion as the primary motivator in the Neolithic, as opposed to environment. In particular, I would argue that it is the ordering process of self-civilizing that acts as such a force, where religion is both a tool and an explanation for that process. The invention of writing, that milestone in human history, has suffered from the same research bias I've just described. The invention of writing in Mesopotamia is widely seen as an outgrowth of accounting practices and the increasingly complex administrative needs of a burgeoning urban society. The focus by researchers on counting and accounting has been at the expense of social, visual, and spiritual questions. If technologies of writing extend back, I should say technologies of memory, extend back thousands of years into the Neolithic, and the primary motivator in the Neolithic was religion, as has been recently argued, it shouldn't be surprising to find that techniques used to remember were linked to ritual. In fact, by exploring the visual component of memory objects, such as seals and palettes, I have found just that. In this talk, I will explore that visual tradition to understand the background from which writing emerged and the power struggles that accompanied it we must consider not only the economic necessities of the early Uruk city-state, but also the deeply rooted belief systems of the region and how those were affected by the newly centralized state. I will begin by introducing the key moment of change, the urban revolution, when cities replace villages, when temple replaces shaman, and when writing replaces earlier techniques of recording. And then we'll move backwards in time to explore the Neolithic societies that preceded the urban revolution. In the second half of the fourth millennium BC, the site of Uruk in southern Mesopotamia grew in size and population, far exceeding any other site in southern Mesopotamia, or for that matter, any site in the world. Uruk was the world's first city. Just as in modern cities, the most ancient city was characterized by formal institutions, large temples, like you see here, storage areas, city walls, roads, irrigation channels, and some manner of king with religious, political, and military authority. And here you see cylinder seal impressions showing this king figure, the one with the beard and the skirt, doing a variety of roles, including overseeing the beating of prisoners and um, making religious offerings and so on. The growth of population, monumental architecture, and powerful political institutions went hand in hand with economic changes, such as trade specialization and the development of a centralized redistributive economy. These rapid sweeping changes brought with them another key development, the invention of writing. Writing was first used for mundane tasks, such as keeping receipts and bills and lists of items, such as grain stores. This early writing, called proto-cuneiform, consisted of numerical notation combined with simple pictographs, incised on clay tablets. The fact that early writing was so closely linked to numerical notation and record keeping has helped shape research on the subject, drawing attention to the administrative and accounting needs that presumably drove the invention of writing. The origin of writing is still not well understood. It was long assumed that pictographic script preceded abstract writing, but it was not until as recently as the 20th century that the earliest tablets in Mesopotamia were found, and some scholars still suspect that earlier versions have yet to be found. Nevertheless, whether the known archaic texts from Uruk are the oldest or older versions remain to be found in earlier levels at Uruk, it is assumed that the first writing occurred along with the first cities in the late fourth millennium. It has been seen as a sort of gestalt phenomenon in human history, faced with the conundrum of large temple stores, laborers, and the like to keep track of, 
clever temple personnel invented a system of writing to serve their record keeping needs. However, it was noted by Pierre Amier and Denise Schmont-Besserat that counting tools, or tokens, had been in use in the Near East for thousands of years before writing was invented. Their work revealed that writing did not emerge from nothing, but rather from a long history of record keeping. However, Schmont-Besserat's interpretation of how tokens led to writing is significantly flawed, in that it stresses a single line of development from token to clay envelope to tablet. I will return to this model in a few minutes. My research has revealed that the history is much richer and more complex than this unilinear evolutionary model proposed by Schmont Besserat would allow. Indeed, a wide range of objects and images were chosen by different societies over the course of 5,000 years to store and communicate information. In fact, tokens were but one of many tools used during the Neolithic period to externalize memory. In another paper, I catalog the many symbolic artifacts that might have been used to store and transmit meaningful information in the millennia before writing was introduced. For that component of my research, I mined through the many site reports to identify possible memory tools. I argue for their function as such um, elsewhere. Here, I wish to draw attention to the continuity in that visual tradition associated with these objects and consider function only in as much as it relates to the invention of writing in the late fourth millennium. I will begin with the earliest examples and proceed with a small sample of what I believe to be related images from the ensuing millennia. The earliest examples come from Jerf el Ahmar, a site in Syria, which you can see on the map here. And these are palettes like the one I've been showing you. They're made of baked clay with symbols carved on them, along with several carved grooved stones, and they were found there dating to approximately 9000 BC. It's easier to see the motifs on these drawings. The carved designs include a scorpion, a serpent, a quadruped or four-legged animal, a bird, and abstract markings such as wavy lines and a, a kind of a grid pattern. You might note that the pattern of images on the objects, and you're looking at a front and back of each on the left, um, seems to be a figural design on one side and a geometric pattern on the other. And this could perhaps be taken to indicate a complex concept on the one hand and a tally or some other record on the other. Though I'll return to that interpretation um, in a few minutes. Comparison of these palettes to other artifacts of similar date reveal their precocity. Their date at about 9000 BC puts them at the end of the Epipaleolithic period, long before the burgeoning of symbolic expression in the later Neolithic of the Near East at places such as Chatal Huyuk. The richness of the iconography of the Jerf el Ahmar pieces is striking. In particular, I find it significant that the motifs chosen for these pieces so closely resemble iconography seen in later glyptic seal, seal carving and wall painting. Note, for example, the piece in the upper left with the central figure of the quadruped under which is a wavy line with a point of an arrow at the end of it. Above the quadruped are two wavy lines and at the head of the animal is a bird with spread wings, probably an eagle or a vulture. This is just a very small sample of other visual evidence from the Neolithic Near East to give you an idea of the wealth of related visual imagery. The bird depicted at the head of the animal on the palette is similar to the later wall paintings at Chatal Huyuk. And all of the elements, the vulture, quadruped, and the filling elements, such as wavy lines, are found in the glyptic of northern Mesopotamia during the 5th and 4th millennia. 
Such similarity in imagery over 5,000 years is remarkable, and it demands that these Jerf el Ahmar palettes are given a place in the development of stamp seals in the Near East. And a stamp seal is the object you see in the lower left. You see a seal, a modern impression from that seal, and then below a drawing of the impression so that you can see those elements more clearly. These visual traditions and the corresponding patterns of memory tool use provide a rich, complex background for the invention of writing. The second example I want to show you from this visual tradition comes from Sabi Abiyad, a site not far from Jerf el Ahmar in the Balik Valley in northern Syria. The period of interest to us today dates to approximately 6,000 BC. This level at Sabi Abiyad was destroyed by fire and thus both architecture and in situ finds are well preserved. These finds include approximately 300 clay ceilings. To be very clear about the terminology I'm using, the seal is the button-like object used to impress a design on clay or plaster. A ceiling is a piece of clay used to seal something, a container or a door, for example. Sometimes these ceilings are impressed, meaning that they bear the mark of a seal impression. Many of the 300 ceilings from Sabi Abiyad are impressed, and in fact, they are the earliest known seal impressions on clay. Along with the ceilings, tokens were found, both from good contexts of use, providing the earliest clear example of tokens and ceilings being used together in an, in an administrative system. This suggests the kind of accounting and administrative activity that has been identified as a step towards writing, but in a context nearly 3,000 years before writing. The ceilings and tokens from Sabi Abiyad were found in storerooms and archives across the village. The motifs include quadrupeds, vegetal and geometric motifs, as well as a human figure with a misshapen head. And you can see that in the lower left. On that particular ceiling, the top of the head is missing. But there are impressions from the same seal that show that that figure has a kind of a cone head sticking up off the top. While well, Sabi Abiyad marks the first well-documented instance in the Near East of the use of seals and tokens together to remember and communicate information, the people of this village were drawing on a long history of use of these objects and the imagery found on them. The seal carvers drew from a body of motifs that had been in use for some time, as evidenced by the very early glyptic at Jerf el Ahmar, which I showed you, as well as a number of seal impressions on plaster from several sites a bit earlier than Sabi Abiyad, which we don't have time to look at today. As I will demonstrate, the motifs, the pointy-headed anthropomorphic figure, the caprids and other quadrupeds, and filling motifs, continue in the periods that follow. The third example of the persistence of this style of glyptic comes from a site called Deir Mentepe, dating to about 4000 BC. Deir Mentepe is located north of the other sites we've looked at, in southeast Turkey on the upper Euphrates. From this phase at Deir Mentepe, 24 stamp seals were found characterized again by both geometric and figural images. In addition, approximately 450 ceilings were found, some of which were impressed. Similar to the situation at Sabi Abiyad, the majority of the seals and ceilings were found in courtyards or storage areas. And you can notice on the examples I'm showing you here, the variety of motifs, and in particular, the way they are combined. So on the upper left, you see a bird with outspread wings above a snake. And to the right of that is a four-legged animal with filling motifs. And when I, so look, when I talk about filling motifs, I mean these. Uh, <laughs> these small shapes sort of above and below the animal. And you can see something similar on the bottom left. And then in that same, um, 
diagram where it says number four, you can see one of these human figures. And also to the right, the four-legged animal under number eight with some kind of a zigzag line above it. And then up above, I show you again the palette from Jerfel Ahmar just to compare. Here are some more from the same site, so you can get another sense of the combination of these images. The final example I will present is two sites dating to the middle to late fourth millennium, the period during which urbanism develops in southern Mesopotamia. These two sites, Tepe Gaura and Arslan Tepe, are located in northern Mesopotamia, however, in the same region as the other sites I have discussed. Arslan Tepe is near Deir Men Tepe. Tepe Gaura is across the Tigris River to the east. At both sites, ceilings with seal impressions were found in storage and religious areas. The ceilings are from sacks, jars, baskets, doors, tags, and bulla, and these are clay lumps that are attached to string. Here are a few examples. Stylistically, the steel impressions from both sites show similarly conceived images, two animals shown one on top of the other, an animal with two or three smaller animals around it, a circular arrangement of motifs, filling elements. You see again on the bottom, the center figure, this um, human or human-like figure with a misshapen head along with a snake, a four-legged animal, and what might be a bird. The same elements are in the image to the right. To the left, you see again birds and four-legged animals, what look like they may be fish. They look kind of like penguins, but I think that's unlikely. Um, up above, on where it says number 35, you can see again those birds with the outspread wings. The preservation at Arslan Tepe has allowed for careful excavation of a palace complex where thousands of impressed ceilings were found in storerooms. In all of these examples, the ceilings were not found in random contexts, but in storage and courtyard areas. Now at Arslan Tepe, we find the same situation, but at a much greater scale. So we have thousands of ceilings, and that's fitting given the fact that this is a much more elaborate context, a palace as opposed to um, a simple building in a village. I want to emphasize that this was a very elaborate system of record keeping, dating to just a couple of hundred years before writing was invented to the south, but writing was never adopted here. This summary, um, which is is designed just to give you an example of the variety of objects that are used over this period that I've been talking about to store information. And it demonstrates how Schmott Besserat's simple evolutionary model of tokens to clay envelopes to writing falls short. I'll take a moment now to explore that model because it does dominate the current scholarship on the invention of writing. And this model is attractive in its simplicity and ultimately in its teachability. Um, but it does ignore the variation in the material record, which I um, draw your attention to here. Significantly, it also focuses on the administrative aspect of writing and record keeping and neglects the visual symbolic component of these practices. According to this model, Tokens were used in a consistent way as tools for counting particular commodities for thousands of years. In the mid-fourth millennium, cylinder seals were invented and employed to control or authenticate transactions. What I've been showing you so far are stamp seals, which you can imagine, as I said, is sort of a button that you would press into clay. A cylinder seal is shaped like um, a spool that you would find thread on. And the images are carved around that spool so that it can then be rolled out in a continuous image. The cylinder seal in the late fourth millennium replaces the earlier stamp seals. At about the same time, the mid fourth millennium BC, 
these two types of objects, tokens and cylinder seals, were combined in a sense. The tokens were enclosed in a clay ball, and like an envelope, it sealed them and protected them from tampering, theoretically. The clay envelope was then impressed with a cylinder seal to authenticate and control it. The impetus for the invention of the clay envelope, according to this model, can be recreated as follows. And this is just a kind of example of what might have happened. If I were to send five donkey loads of textiles from Uruk up the Euphrates to a site in Syria and had somebody in charge of that caravan, I would give him five tokens to present to my contact in Syria. My contact would count the five tokens, count the five donkey loads, and know that the shipment was complete. But there would be nothing to stop my driver from selling off one of those donkey loads, pocketing the profit, and tossing one of the tokens into the Euphrates. He would then arrive with four tokens and four donkey loads, and the transaction would appear complete. So the story goes, the clay envelope was invented to secure that so that the five tokens are in the clay ball, and the clay, of course, hardens, so that after it's been shaped into the clay ball, the only way to get those tokens out would be to break it, so that my, um, my messenger would carry this clay envelope to Syria instead, and on arrival, it could be cracked open, and the five tokens could be compared to the five donkey loads. The story goes on that the clay envelope was marked with the tokens themselves after it was made but before it had hardened so that on the outside there would be five marks corresponding to the five tokens within. That way, anyway, anywhere along the way, the numbers could be verified without having to break open that clay envelope. Um, it would soon be realized, of course, that the tokens within were no longer needed. All you would need would be a piece of clay with five marks on it and a seal impression to authenticate it, and you have the same verifiable document. With that, the numerical tablet was born. Numerical tablets, like the one you see there under number four, include numerical markings and a seal impression. The stratigraphy at Uruk suggests that these numerical tablets were quickly followed by tablets marked with numerical signs and simple pictographs, generally seen as the earliest form of writing. This is a very tidy explanation. I think you can see that it assumes a lot, um, yet it still makes sense. In developing this model for the invention of writing, Schmont Besserat draws a single unidirectional line from tokens to cylinder seals to writing via these clay envelopes. Schmont Besserat's views have been critiqued, yet they remain widely cited. A key problem with her work is that it assumes a constant unchanging use and meaning for tokens during the entire Neolithic period, in which the tokens were used to count commodities. It also sees writing as a rather sudden development of that accounting system in the fourth millennium. The possibility that tokens, these simple lumps of clay, could have had other meanings or uses is not allowed. The other precursors to writing, the stamp seals that were used for thousands of years before cylinder seals, the pallets I've shown you, the seal impressions, which were kept with the tokens and archived, the figurines that are often found along with those tokens and seal impressions, and a variety of other ob ar objects and artifacts are not included in the explanation. Furthermore, you'll note that Schmont Besserat's explanation focuses on counting and accounting. The emphasis on tokens, rather than on the image-bearing artifacts, or even the images from the cylinder seals, allows her explanation to rest solely on the economic needs of the burgeoning urban society, which surely must have been significant. Yet as I have demonstrated, there is a wealth of imagery carved on many of these objects, and many of those images recur over thousands of years. The association of the images with the memory tools demands acknowledgement. As I warned earlier, 
It is challenging to interpret prehistoric art. It's challenging to interpret contemporary art, and many art historians disagree with each other. Keeping in mind that challenge and the polysemic nature of symbols, I still believe it's possible to begin to understand this imagery. I argue that, first, it is religious. Second, it is linked to what I identify as the central organizing principle of the Neolithic period, the domestic versus the wild. I will return to the second point in a moment. I want to go back to the earliest examples I showed you, these palettes from Jerf el Ahmar. When I first started studying these, I noticed certain images that link them to the later stamp seals of the Near East, these images that I've mentioned, the bird, the animal, and so on. Additionally, though, the simpler designs, such as the cross-hatched lines, the chevrons, and the wavy lines, appear not only here, but on the stamp seals of the later Neolithic. I will return to my interpretation of the figural images in a moment, but first I want to address these abstract motifs. I had never tried to interpret them, either on these objects or the later seals, except to speculate that they could have served as tallies. However, it recently came to my attention that similar imagery is often associated with the first stage of a state of transformed consciousness of the type a person would experience during meditation, a trance, a near-death experience, or under the influence of a hallucinogenic drug. These images, which are seen as the state is entered, are called entoptic phenomena. They include grid-like patterns, parallel lines, zigzags, or undulating lines. And that's what you see here on the left. To briefly summarize the rest of the episode, in the second stage, a person often has the feeling of going through a tunnel, water, or some other enclosed space. In the third stage, the entoptic images are transformed by the brain into known experiences. Wavy lines become snakes, for example. Images also transform one into another, humans into animals, and vice versa as shown here rather humorously with the wolf wearing a suit. This part of the experience in particular is culturally determined. The known world that shapes those transformations varies. These entoptic images and the whole episode of altered consciousness, it is argued, is neurologically generated. David Lewis Williams and David Pierce in a recent book argue that these neurological experiences became religious beliefs, and these religious beliefs shaped the course of the Neolithic. These authors do not discuss the Jerf palettes, but I see it as significant that among the first images created in the Near East, these images could be interpreted as a record of a religious experience, a mental transformation. Of particular significance is that even these non-figural motifs, which might seem to be beyond our ability to interpret, correspond so closely to the range of entoptic imagery. Now returning to the figural imagery, I've already pointed out these recurring elements, the bird, snake, human with misshapen head, the four-legged animal, and the filling elements which resemble vegetation, such as a shaft of wheat. These are the images from memory tools, but similar imagery was also found on monumental stone sculpture, roughly contemporary to the palettes of 9000 BC. Humans, wild animals, and birds dominate the imagery from these large stone stela. Neither animals nor plants were domesticated at this point in southeastern Turkey, where these sculptures were found. Surely these images meant different things to the different people, societies, and at the various moments during the Neolithic from which they originate. Yet the principal motifs point to a basic struggle, the domestic versus the wild. As I said a moment ago, I see this as the central organizing principle of the Neolithic period. 
Indeed, that principle is how we define Neolithic. The term means New Stone Age, but it has come to be used as a label in various parts of the world for the time period when humans settled down in one place and domesticated plants and animals, rather than relying solely on hunting and gathering. This explanation, like so much of the scholarship on the Neolithic, is economic and materialist. It focuses on the mode of production. And yet, it is a useful paradigm. The paradigm, in fact, applies to non-economic aspects of life as well. Increasing evidence shows us that people settle down not for economic reasons, not for the purpose of, of farming, for the purpose of raising animals, but at least in some cases, for spiritual reasons. The process of settling down in one place, of learning to live together, is a civilizing process. It differentiates the village, the house, as a home, as something distinct from the wild. Furthermore, as people did learn to domesticate plants and then animals, this structuralist division of home or domestic, in contrast to wild, took on a broader implication. With the paradigm of controlling the wild in mind, we can begin to interpret these recurring motifs. A vulture or eagle feeds on carrion, bridging the gap between death and life. Snakes shedding their skin represent a rebirth and rejuvenation. The four-legged animal and plant would link that cycle of life, death, and rebirth to the domestication of plants and animals. The fertility and fecundity of those resources, their very life and death, was newly within the power of humans to control. Humans had taken these wild forces the life and death of the Earth's wild resources, and learn to control them. The appearance of the human shaman figure strengthens this reading, alluding to the control by humans of this life cycle and its place within the realm of magic and ritual. Surely the nature of the struggle between humans and the wild was different from the early Neolithic to the late Neolithic and from one region of the Near East to another. But the persistence of these archetypal images throughout the Neolithic period attests to their continued power. What is clear is that a wealth of memory technologies preceded the invention of writing. It is also clear that these objects were closely associated with shamanistic religious beliefs. We are left with the question of what happens to this tradition in the late fourth millennium BC when writing is invented. The focal point of the new cities were the large temple complexes, whose priests seem to have acted as kings and controlled a redistributive economy. This was no longer the shamanistic religion of the villages. One might employ the distinction developed by Harvey Whitehouse and see a difference between an imagistic and a doctrinal mode of religiosity. The power of the shamans and the power of the domestic over the wild was co-opted by the temple. At the same time, they co-opted the process of storing memory, developing a writing system whose techniques were guarded by the temple scribes. In a recent article, Lambert Karlofsky argues that societies contemporary to the later Rook actively resisted the adoption of writing in order to resist the attendant social control. And I have to emphasize the importance of that argument because it's generally thought that the areas outside of southern Mesopotamia were just too backwards to learn how to write. So this is a very different way of seeing it. It's recognizing the development of local technologies of local cultures and seeing it as an active choice not to adopt writing. In Lambert Karlovsky's view, to resist the attendant social control of the later Rook polity, I would, I would agree with his argument, adding that in resisting writing, 
they may also have been resisting the co-optation and replacement of their religious belief systems with that of the temple state. As you can see, the current prevailing explanation for the invention of writing, which focuses solely on accounting, fails to tell the much more interesting story of religious belief, the power of humans over nature, and the changing modes of production that accompanied a corresponding change in religious beliefs and practices. By taking into account the visual traditions during the Neolithic period, we can achieve a much more nuanced, complex understanding of the way people communicated, remembered, and controlled information in the years before writing developed. Seeing these artifacts as the results of choices made by different societies moves the agent of change from a self-propelled evolutionary system to the people living within those societies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. I, I'm sure there will be some questions uh, on that fascinating talk, and so I'm going to, uh, we have microphones. If you'll raise your hand, would you like to call in your own? It doesn't matter. Okay. Then, then uh, this is being taped, of course, and the microphone will allow everyone to hear your question and for it to also be heard on the tape. Sarah, thank you. And it's so interesting how, just thinking about these objects in prehistory, how you're essentially kind of working around a revisionist prehistory. And so I've got a question about the nature of the object base that you're working with. And it's a, I guess it's a methodological question. Um, and that has to do with, um, is it possible to draw distinctions or useful to draw distinctions, do you think, between um, looking at the object base as an artifact base versus as a base of works of art that can collectively allow for some degree of latitude within individual interpretation? And then how do we go about reconstructing that in essentially a prehistoric <laughs> period? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's an excellent question. Excuse me. And I, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I think that you're hitting on one of the problems <clears throat> which I tried to allude to in the beginning, which is that we have these methodological and sort of disciplinary divides. And I think it really has hampered the study of these objects. And as, as you said, instead of seeing them as artifacts, but rather art objects, which would allow for perhaps a greater variety of interpretations, um, you know, this, this series is Scientia, and, and I find myself, as I prepared this talk, thinking a lot about science, and, and my background is a scientist, well, I'm trying to think about hallucinatory experiences and becoming rather uncomfortable by that, but um, I think it would benefit from moving outside of a more traditional scientific approach to the objects. So that would be, I suppose, the short answer to your question would be yes. Uh, your title... Your title slide had a <clears throat> I chose this one because I happen to have a good <laughs> image of a cylinder seal. But I've been looking at it as I prepared the talk. And actually, what you can see um, represented on the lower register and on the upper register as well is what's probably a temple workshop 
and these are um, temple personnel who are weaving cloth. So you see looms represented. Um, and certainly on the top, that's what we're looking at. And I believe that's what we're seeing on the bottom, but I have to say I haven't given a whole lot of thought to this particular image. But it represents the kind of shift that I was talking about during this time period. We, everything changes. You go from household technologies to ones that are completely controlled by the temple authority so that you have corvée laborers who are working for the temple and are given rations in exchange for their labor. So the whole mode of subsistence shifts and that's what you see shown on the cylinder seals from the later rook period. have to draw a distinction necessarily between the two so that yes I think that there was this experience of altered consciousness now that may be you know the result of ritual of meditation of you know various things can bring on the state so it's not necessarily something like drugs causing a hallucination but yes yeah, so this altered consciousness but that's forming the core of a religious belief system and how to translate that into what's being counted or stored or remembered that's a distance that I don't I don't want to try to bridge that because you know I talked about the difficulty of interpreting meaning in the past and I feel strongly that you can interpret meaning, but only to a point. You know, that the human mind is far too complex, can create far too many, um, you know, ways of doing things and, and ways of thinking for us to say, you know, well, five tokens meant five donkey loads of cloth, for example. So I would put the experience of counting of remembering, excuse me, <clears throat> in a religious context, but beyond that, <clears throat> excuse me, I would stop. So, excuse me. What I always loved about Denise Schmoll Besserat's uh, narrative, her story, was the fact that it took on these enormous transformations and it made some sort of economic sense of them. But what always bothered me is so much of the early Uruk art, the early urban art, has ends up with clear religious statements that all of this, all of the economics, all of the counting, ends up, of course. Uh, in some sort of religious conception, the vase of Baruch is a great example, I think, of that. But Denise, who taught me this, this stuff, was profoundly skeptical of gleaning any sort of real information from the imagery. And that's, you, you really have, in fact, uh, taken on that task, and, and I think that's really important. And going back to what Marsha was saying, that Denise really didn't think art history had a lot to to do with the, the important aspects of the explanation, that it was economic, it, it was uh, this sort of bean counting in a very precise way. And that the fact that so much of this bean counting was integrated into a clearly religious, imagistic scaffolding was just something that we could talk about. She always said, oh, well, you know, how do we know that? Well, how can you say that about that image? That's ridiculous. Well, that's, that's interesting to hear because I haven't had an opportunity 
to discuss this with her. And, I, you know, I, I hope to at some point. And so, you know, I, I wondered what, what her response well, might be, and, and, and that gives me some, some sense of, well, this of it. Is me, because this is pre Lewis Williams, right? Mm -hmm. And I, that the entoptic material and what well, Lewis Williams has done with Paleolithic cave paint specifically in its relation mm -hmm. to it's, it's brilliant. And I think that uh, she might, I mean, that might be something of interest, for example. Denise, I haven't, I haven't mm -hmm. spoken to her about right, this right. in yeah. a long time. Yeah, and, and you know, I, what, what Lewis Williams points out is that we, as, as scientists, we are skeptical of the religious because we are in a society that keeps these things very distinct. But the idea of keeping our economic transactions and our bureaucracy distinct from religion is a completely modern Western notion. So there's really no reason why we can't talk about those together and why we shouldn't talk about them together, because certainly in the Neolithic, they were closely bound. Yeah, th those are the paragraphs I, I deleted um, to try, you know, so I didn't keep you all here till, till midnight. But um, these have been referred to as shaft straighteners because they're similar to stone objects that have the same kind of groove on the back that date to, uh, you know, near in time in, in Paleolithic, Neolithic, Neolithic terms, and from and from sort of nearby, um, but there are no arrowheads to go along with the supposed shafts that these would have straightened. Um, and you know, it, it was pointed out, and, and I would have to check my references to give you the the exact um, um, source of this that they could have a much more symbolic um, kind of, of, of meaning that they resemble female genitalia and that there might be a kind of female-male duality or, 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 or some other significance to them. I hadn't thought about the tactile um, aspect. Mm -hmm. I, just, I guess when I was looking at them, I was thinking about how they're, how they're actually physically being used mm -hmm. by people. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you, you do such a nice job sort of taking us through what the images may be. And I'm just, I just kind of imagine how people are actually physically using them. Yeah, I, 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 I have to admit my imagination hasn't, hasn't gone to that point yet. I'm still, as I said, dealing with the, the, the hallucinations. So um, <laughs> I, have my own, I have my own reservations that I, that, that I have to get past. But um, no, I, I thank you for bringing that up because the use of these objects, we have stamps that weren't used to seal anything. We have ceilings with no stamps that go with them. There are a lot of questions like that that remain to be answered. of the sort of preliterate shamanic culture to this temple-based religious system. I was wondering if 
if, if there's any evidence or if there's imagery to show how shamanic elements, including trance or these sorts of altered states of consciousness, might have been incorporated into the temple-based religion, or is that... Yeah, no, that's an excellent <coughs> question. And, and um, a colleague um, drew my attention to what I find to be an extremely exciting um, myth that suggests how that might have happened. And it's called the legend of Etana. Um, so this is coming from historical periods in southern Mesopotamia. And, and, and I won't go into detail on it, but it includes um, an eagle and a snake and a man who he and his wife want to have a child. So you have this birth element. And it is the eagle who has to bring Etana to the plant that provides the possibility of birth. But what's so interesting is not just those same kind of archetypal um, elements, but that the plant is guarded by the gods of the Sumerian pantheon in the heavens. So the eagle brings Etana to the plant, but the plant is being guarded by those gods. So it's as though the whole essence of that power is now in the hands of the pantheon. So I mean, I, I find that to be just, you know, a kind of incredible answer to that question of what happens. Um, whether one can read it that literally or not, I don't know, but I certainly like to. Because uh, I then want to just say um, what a great time I have had listening to this as someone who has taught ancient civilizations and been thinking about those early scribes as being rather, uh, you know, grindy accountants and whatnot. <laughs> and now I can envision them and imagine them in another way as people on a vision quest. Maybe that's what they're counting. I mean, you wouldn't go that far, but... I'm free uh, being outside the discipline to speculate at will, <laughs> and that they are, you know, noting exactly what they saw in their vision quest in these very cultures. These are the, yeah. So I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thought, and I've learned a great deal, and I would like to just say also that I'm so glad that you mentioned uh, resistance to technological change, because sometimes we overlook what a significant factor that is in the shaping of histories and whatnot, that there are people who have been willing to and had good reasons, and people who haven't, and they had good reasons too, and that's part of our reconstruction. So I want to I wanna thank you very much, Sarah, for a wonderful lecture. Thank you all for coming, and please join us outside for a wine and cheese reception. Thank you. This program is protected by copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice University Digital Media Services.